Hello and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we talk to experts about all things finance. If you get value out of this episode, please subscribe so you don't miss out on any in the future. I hope you enjoy. Russell, thank you so much for joining the podcast to talk about your recently released book, uh, The Asian Financial Crisis, 1995 to 98, uh, The Birth of the Age of Debt. So on to my first question. Uh, many of our listeners are young investors who may not even have been born during the crisis, which is pretty crazy to think. Um, but can you please explain more about the crisis, what was happening at the time and the catalysts that led up to it? Yeah, sure. So it lives in the shadow of what we now call the great financial crisis. But believe me, at the time, it didn't seem like it was going to be an Asian financial crisis. It seemed it was going to be a global financial crisis. And that's why it is actually so important. It, it led to a default by the government of Russia. It led to significant problems in Latin America. And the reason it seemed like it could be a global problem is that the world's developed banks had lent hundreds of billions to these countries. So it then seemed that it was going to feed its way into the developed world through the banking system. And we might get on to why it didn't get to that stage. But this is a bit like a brush fire. You know, it was burning. It was burning straight towards the center of the global financial system. And we didn't know at the time that it would stop. So it was a big thing. It was obviously a very big thing if you happen to be Asian. Uh, some of the stock markets in dollar terms fell by 90%, 90% in dollar terms. That would be uh, Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, you know, and I, as I point out in the book, some of these markets are still not above where they were in the 1990s. So you're always told invest for the long term, invest for the long term. Well, that's kind of the long term now. And you, you, you've got your dividends, so it hasn't been a period with no returns. So that was the, the magnitude of the whole thing, a huge impact on the wealth of people in Asia looked like it could uh, become global. Uh, and just basically at its core, the, the, there, was a, there was managed exchange rate policies. Now, that might sound to people listening a little bit technocratic, but actually it's very, very, very important. And there are lots of other countries that run managed exchange rate policies today, particularly China, but it's quite prevalent across the emerging markets. And that was the great surprise. It was how those policies had distorted what people call the fundamentals. And the fundamentals didn't really exist. They were a byproduct of a very unfundamental, very dangerous, out of kilter monetary policy, which came from these policies. So it's a lesson in that particular instance, why macro factors counted. And I'm not gonna sit here and tell you they always counted, but in this particular situation with these policies, macro factors turned out to be much, much more important than the so-called uh, fundamentals. So the great shock for most investors was they were buying these fundamentals and then they discovered that they didn't exist because they were a byproduct of a very un unfundamental monetary and credit policy. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you talk about fundamentals, you mean they're like fundamentals of companies and the actual economy themselves? Yeah, so like a lot of the companies that were listed here were banks and property companies. Uh, and if you had a monetary policy, which created 25% growth in bank credit every year, guess, guess what happened to bank stocks? They went up. And guess what a lot of the money was being lent to? It was being lent to property stocks. So guess what? They went up. And the market had come to believe that this was kind of, that's what happened in a growth economy. That was all perfectly normal. And then, of course, what happened is we began to see the other side of that. What happens when interest rates go up? What happens when banks don't lend? What happens to those asset prices? So, so these fundamentals of rising property prices, rising uh, bank earnings, plenty of credit in the system to go out and buy new cars, all of that was the fundamentals, but it wasn't that fundamental because it was all fundamentally related to the availability of cheap money and cheap credit. Yeah, definitely. I think what you said as well in the book is that it was very short term credit as well. And that was the big issue that, you know, they have to keep getting more credit to pay off that. And then it, they just lost yeah. liquidity, basically. Yeah. Well, you raise a, a second important issue. What made this one so special was so much of the credit had been borrowed in another currency. So these currencies, as I said, were managed. People came to conclude that they couldn't fall against the United States dollar. Now, if you concluded that they couldn't fall against the United States dollar, you might as well borrow United States dollars. So and obviously the interest rates was much, much, much cheaper. So you would go, you wanted to buy a car, you would borrow US dollars and you would buy a car in Indonesian rupiah. Now that's pretty nuts. And that was on a small household basis. But of course the big corporations were doing it for billions of dollars and billions of dollars. So when the exchange rates fell, it wasn't just, you know, it was just complete mayhem. The, the, the value of liabilities went shooting up in local currency terms, Thai baht terms, Indonesian rupiah terms. So there was an added layer, I think most people you know, you don't have to be that uh, that old to realize that too much debt is a problem. But believe me, if you borrow in one currency to invest in another currency, then it can be a huge problem if the currency moves against you. And that's what exacerbated this one and made it so extreme. It wasn't just too much debt. It was too much debt in the wrong currency and borrowed short term. So you were kind of rolling over three month dollar debt. 
And then basically you came back at the end of three months and the, and the uh, creditor said, uh, no, you can't have it this time. That's what, that's what happens. So borrowing short, borrowing in a foreign currency, all fundamental errors, which we assume will never happen again. Yeah, well, hopefully not. And I think, as you said, that the currencies were pegged. So um, I've seen some of the charts, you know, once it happened and you look at, uh, you know, how much they dropped. And I guess that the issues then is because you're owing US dollars and your currency has dropped so much against the, um, you know, the US dollars. It's just the debt's a lot larger than you originally thought. Yeah, so the, there is no equity. I mean, uh, I like to call equity the fine sliver of hope between assets and liabilities. And when that happens, your liabilities move so fast, there is no equity. And yet what's listed on the stock market is the equity. So you can see this creates a huge problem in trying to work out what it's worth, if anything. It's not something that happens really in developed markets that quickly, very occasionally. But almost instantaneously, you had no idea whether there was any equity because you didn't really know how, how big the liabilities were going to get. Currency falls 5% more. That means your liabilities are up 5% more. But what happens if the currency falls 25% more? And then you've got a geared effect, your liabilities, hopefully your assets are bigger, but then it's all completely geared as well. So the uncertainty with that meant that it was very hard to value an Asian equity. It wasn't clear at all that you as the owner of the share owned the company. It, it could easily have happened that the creditors to the company owned all the assets They would, and you would get absolutely nothing. So that's why, that's, that's why markets can fall 90%. It's when the value of those liabilities can really go up very quickly. Yeah, and I guess uh, a key issue as well that's mentioned is liquidity and sort of investors' belief that almost, you know, the equity markets, you can go in, you can go out, there's always liquidity. But I think that was, as you said, that because people didn't know, know if there was any value, you know, they, they just couldn't. So because everyone's trying to get out, no one's buying, it just, as you said, that's where you see the 90% drop. What you get in a situation like that is a huge spread because the uncertainty is yeah. so great that the spread is so big. And as you've just said, when that happens, you get a lack of liquidity. There was another interesting form of lack of liquidity because Malaysia in particular, not until as it happened at the very end of the crisis, but in September 1998, they imposed uh, capital controls, which meant that if you had a share in Malaysia, you could sell it and you could get ring it, but you couldn't change ring it into any other currency. So we always think that liquidity is a function of the marketplace, but sometimes it's a function of legislation and politics. Uh, and of course, if you are Greek or separate or from Iceland, you will have had these same capital controls imposed upon you within the last it's now 12 years. So we mustn't forget that there's two ways that liquidity can disappear. Yes, it can be just an inability for, for buyers and sellers to meet in a huge spread, but it can be imposed upon you by the government. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And um, you personally, you had a pretty good view of the events. You were being you were based in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, so how did that sort of help you understand the situation? And you, you said it felt like it was almost the end of the world. <laughs> Yeah, these are big, I mean, these are very, very big economies. Uh, and the one that, uh, if I say to you, Thailand, you say that's a small economy, fair enough. But Korea was at, the, was at the heart of this. Now, Korea at that stage is one of the biggest export countries in the world. And the idea of Korea going bankrupt, and it came exceedingly close to running out of foreign exchanges. It came that close. There are, there, are, there are social, political, and military implications from this. You know, we all know that there's been no reconciliation between North Korea and South Korea, the American troops in South Korea. Uh, when this rolled into Indonesia, there were big questions about whether the Americans were actually trying to get a military base in Indonesia in return for some sort of bailout. So when, you know, most corrections in stock markets are corrections in stock markets, this was geopolitical. And then the big question overhanging all of it is, would China devalue their currency? And that was such a fright of fear to everybody because that would have huge global ramifications. So the reason that this was, was frightening is that, you know, we Westerners call it Asia, you know, and, and it's like it's one homogenous lump of things, but it was so different. I mean, over a thousand people died in Indonesian riots. Uh, some people died in Malaysian riots. There were these geopolitical issues going on. Uh, the Sixth Fleet wasn't too far from Taiwan. Would China use this as, you know, so, the, so it's easy to look back in history and say, hey, it's a stock market thing. But when you're living through it, it, it definitely wasn't. It was a much, much bigger thing than that. And that's why it was, was so frightening, had these other ramifications. Yeah, definitely. I guess it's something that we saw last year with COVID as well. It's just, it's not what's happening. It's the uncertainty. You know, this could happen, that could happen. We saw it with Russia on the border of Ukraine recently. It, it's not if it happens, it's just that uncertainty that makes people worried. Well, there's a whole, uh, I mean, I can give you a 90 minute presentation on uncertainty, but one of the things you can prove through behavioral finance is that human beings like, or sorry, dislike uncertainty. Now that actually creates wonderful opportunities 
you know, uncertainty will have a huge negative impact on price. Now, if you're one of those people who isn't that concerned about uncertainty, then A, you have an advantage. Uh, and obviously, if you can have a better view of the future, then you can see somewhat less uncertainty. So there's a long discussion to be had on, certain, on, on uncertainty. But high levels of uncertainty will always give you low prices. And nine out of 10 times, great buying opportunities. Because remember, what people are worried about is not actually what's happening. It's uncertainty about what might happen. And, and, and often those things don't actually happen. So uncertainty is usually a great opportunity when you see it, but incredibly difficult to take advantage of because it feels uh, incredibly dangerous to be forecasting something certain when everybody seems to be running away from uncertainty. Yeah, definitely. It's like we, we have these great imaginations and I think our brains can go wild sometimes. And we, we've seen it recently with the China, obviously antitrust uh, that's happened. Um, but at the time as well, you were, you were working uh, at a brokerage and you're actually a bear, uh, you know, who are not very well liked sometimes by, you know, colleagues and, you know, a lot of people want to always go up. Uh, so what did you see that others didn't? And sort of how would you recommend other people sort of share their business, uh, their bearish ideas if they, if they have them? So there is a, uh, there's lots of literature on crowds as well. And I would recommend reading any of the literature on, on crowds, uh, Gustav Le Bon and Canetti on crowds. It is very difficult, but you should try and at some extent stay out of the crowd. I mean, being in the crowd, so I, I see this with crypto. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you whether crypto is going up or down or not, but I can tell you there's a crowd of enthusiasts. And I think it's very dangerous to be in a crowd of enthusiasts, full stop. It doesn't matter whether it's a football crowd or a crypto crowd or an Asian equity crowd. You know, you do need to have some compassionate, uh, sorry, not compassion, some, some sort of ability to separate yourself from the crowd. So my advantage was I arrived quite late into Asia. So that, that was there. I had been trained at a, at a company called Bailey Gifford, which I think was, you know, prepared to be outside of the crowd. So it's always, I guess, people say, look, I know that. I know I should be outside the crowd. But actually doing it is quite difficult. Because as you say, I mean, for those of you who watch The Big Short, you will know that one of the people who was very successful in that was Michael Burry because he was able to be outside the crowd. It was only after the whole thing was over that he realized that one of, one of his attributes for doing that was he was autistic. He didn't know that, he discovered it afterwards, but the ability to walk into a room and disagree with everybody is something that, you know, like Michael Berry happened to inherit it. Maybe you can teach yourself a little bit of it. Uh, I don't know if I inherited any of it, but at least arriving late for this party with, uh, with some skepticism. Uh, and I, just finally, I had already read quite a lot of financial history. And when you read financial history, you realize these things happen all the time, maybe not of the same magnitude, but they happen all the time. And you're always told that this time it's different. And you probably know those are the four most dangerous words in the English language, this time it's different. So I did arrive a little bit of history and financial, uh, financial history, which told me that uh, this doesn't look that dissimilar to some of the things that we've, we've seen in the past. But none of us can be di entirely dispassionate when faced with such a crowd and you have to be ready to be unpopular. Yeah, I think we definitely saw that, especially in the big short. Like, uh, you know, they say, you know, his friends wouldn't call him back and everything like that. And, you know, I guess it's the unfortunate part of money, isn't it? Um, it can be emotional. But you mentioned something there, which was uh, a key message in the book as well, was history of markets and understanding the history of what's happened before. So why, why do you think that's so important? Well, where, where, where to begin? So I'm, I'm afraid that many people watching this will be doing degrees in, in finance. And I am skeptical about the value of a degree in finance. I'm not skeptical as a first step, but it assumes certain things that aren't actually true. Uh, it assumes a certain degree of efficiency that doesn't actually happen. It assumes a certain degree of rationality that doesn't actually exist. And then people will say to me, well, okay, clever clogs. So you're telling us, you know, so where are we going to find this stuff? Where am I going to learn about that bit then? If this is something I need to overlay, if my, if, if, if my finance degree is the cake, but I need the icing and that's the icing, where am I going to find that icing? Well, there's one way to find it, which is to get a job in finance and, you know, get beaten up, get slapped around a bit. And it kind of, that's an expensive way to get it. But I think the only other way to get it is to read some financial history. And, and understand this other thing that goes on, uh, extrapolative expectations, fear of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, for those of you still who have electives to take, I'd certainly recommend behavioral finance as an elective. And, uh, but yeah, just read some financial history to get an idea of what actually happens. Uh, of course, I'm gonna recommend my book, but uh, actually the one that I think is really, the best book ever written on that element of finance is a very old book. It's called The Money Game by Adam Smith. Now it's not Adam Smith from Kirkcaldy and Fife. This was the pen name of a journalist called George Goodman, but actually it's, a, it's fiction. He wrote it as fiction. 
but it gives you some sense of this other thing that lurks behind the so-called rationality. Uh, and I recommend you read that. But uh, if you get interested in this, there's no end of, well, you can see from looking behind me, there's no end of places for you to stop if you begin to get interested in, in financial history. But stock market history in particular, there actually aren't that many books in stock market history per se. So it wouldn't take too long to read five, six, seven of them. And I think it's a fantastic adjunct or addition to your, uh, to your finance degree. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's something that you say, as you said, you could look at the history and you saw sort of similarities and it's just putting that together. It might not help you get, get the time of when, when it all falls apart, but it, you just prepared, aren't you? Yeah. Well, in terms of the timing, so I, I run a course in, 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 in finance called the Practical History of Financial Markets. We had on that for many years, a teacher called Gordon Pepper, who was a, a great uh, guru advising, and he actually ended up advising Margaret Thatcher on monetary, uh, monetary affairs, but he invented a thing called Pepper's Law, which I like to quote regularly. <laughs> Uh, and Pepper's law is this, when you see something you th happening in a market that you think is entirely unsustainable, you use every rational tool you have to work out how long you think the irrational can be sustained, and then you double it and take off a month. Okay, uh, that's it, quite interesting. It, this, this is always going to go on much, much longer than you can conceive of that. You know, that is obviously not science, but that is as good a guide as I've ever come across as to how you work out for how long the unsustainable can be sustained. Yeah, no, I think that's a really uh, good piece of advice, I reckon. So um, sort of what were the previous events that you saw that sort of helped you not predict, but obviously see that this was unsustainable and the Asian crisis, you know, wouldn't last well, Back in the 70s, when the oil price went up, the oil exporting nations found themselves with huge amounts of US dollars, obviously. And they then had to do something about that. And it was called the petrodollar recycling business. Uh, and what they did is they basically took all those dollars and they put them on deposit with some of the world's largest banks, and the world's largest banks then had a problem. They were at that stage, they were probably getting seven or eight percent interest. So the banks then had to lend that money out to get a higher return. And they decided to lend it to what we now call emerging markets, which in those days were called lesser developed countries. They were called LDCs. They were completely rebranded after this crisis. Uh, and of course, ultimately, what happened is that those massive amounts of dollars that were lent to those LDCs were not repaid. And there were certain things you could look at in the composition of those countries' debt and, and their external accounts. Uh, and the direction of commodity prices, which said that you, know, that you can see how you can build a structural vulnerability and that this lending is, is dangerous. And, and there was a, to a certain extent a repeat of that in Asia because there was a lot of foreign currency lending from these banks into Asia. So that was one of the things that kind of flagged up that this didn't smell good. Uh, a second thing in the financial textbooks, it will always tell you about equity valuations and equity valuations are composed of a discount rate and a growth rate. And, uh, but I'd seen in Japan in 1989, and slightly before that in Taiwan, the equity valuations got to sort of 60 to 80 times. And they weren't driven by fundamentals. They were driven entirely by excessive levels of credit. So there were two points to this. There was an excessive level of credit, which could go wrong. That's what the lesser developed country crisis taught you. But it also said, look, there can be a massive distortion to equity valuation in a situation like this. These things can trade a long, long way from fair value in this sort of distortion. And therefore, the downside can be huge. So that was just maybe just two of them. But obviously since then, I mean, I was a much younger then. Since then, I've read a lot more financial history. And of course, I can see echoes in other events that I didn't know about then uh, that are pretty clear in the Asian financial crisis. And many of them are, are uh, mentioned in the book. Yeah, definitely. And a key part of the book as well is obviously deflation. And we've seen that in Japan where I, you know, 1994, I think around then was the peak. And then, you know, since then, it hasn't really, it hasn't gone above the peak. Well, um, Mr. Buffett says price is what you pay and value is what you get. Uh, and this is a really good lesson because, you know, it's taken a long time for people who bought Japanese equities in the early 90s to break even. Mm -hmm. uh, true for Thailand. Uh, you know, it is true that generally speaking, equities go up in the long run. But if you pay far too much for them, the long run will be, money, will, will be measured in decades, not mm -hmm. years. I think it's one of the great fallacies. There's a great book by uh, Jeremy Siegel called Stocks from the Long Run. And people like to quote it from it all the time. Uh, but you have to remember what the long run is. The long run is decade and a half. You know, how long would it be if you bought an equity before you be almost bought a basket of equities? How long would it be before you'd be guaranteed to break even? Well, about a decade and a half. If I ask the average guy in the street, what's the long run in the equity market? He'll say Christmas. Yeah. So equities do outperform in the long run. Categorically, that is correct. Uh, but you mentioned Japan, that long run turned out to be a very long run indeed, because, and it was easy to work out because you paid too high a valuation. Everybody knew the valuation was too high, but they bought them anyway, because the game became 
not what is the valuation, is that will someone push it to an even higher valuation? So it's become deeply unfashionable to focus on valuation. But if you want to avoid finding yourself in one of these Japan situations or Thai situations where it can take two decades to get a reasonable return, then you do need to keep a very close eye on valuation. Yeah, definitely. And you've linked it to sort of the debt levels that we have today um, all across the world and sort of the high valuations as well in different equity markets. So do you see similarities to then to sort of all markets around the world? Or Yeah, so this is, this is fascinating because there are some valuations where it, which are exceptionally high. And then you come to a different conclusion and you say, wait a minute, they're, they're, the system is so fragile. Can the authorities allow it to collapse? So I'm not saying that authorities have an answer to all questions, that they can always stop a collapse. But I think what we've seen, particularly during COVID, is the extreme situation that the governments will go to to stop this. That doesn't make you long-term bullish on these asset classes. But what it does tell you is this. The Asians took a huge amount of pain to sort this problem out. The developed world isn't. It simply isn't going to do that. It simply isn't going to accept it. And that means more and more government intervention in the markets uh, and in the economy. So to me, what it means is not a sort of sudden massive 1929 to 1932 collapse, but a massive change in government intervention in the economy, which ultimately undermines equities from below, if you like, because I mean, what is equity? It's the, it's the claim over the future cash flow of a corporation. And the more the government gets involved in that, the lower or the less likely it is that that cash flow is going to expand. So it's a very different type of bear market. It's a bear market driven by massive government intervention, which goes on for 10, 15 years, rather, and that undermines um, earnings and therefore undermines uh, prices, rather than the great spectacular kind of crash we see. And I keep tapping this, I should really hold it up. The great spectacular crash that we see in this, in this particular book. It's, it's going to, I think for the developed world, it's going to be something different from that. And that's yeah. very frustrating, you know, if you're, if you're an investor who believes in value, all you want to do is be able to go out and buy value. And if the interference of the authorities makes make sure that it never occurs, actually, it's genuinely very frustrating for an investor. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, in COVID, we saw that where, you know, three weeks are down and they just basically put, put the floor in, said what they were going to do, basically back to most of the companies. And then we've seen that up since then, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, that, that I think is a start of, you know, this, just to be clear, whatever started in COVID, it'll take 15 years before we, we see the end of it. That wasn't the one-off emergency step. That was the beginning of a whole new normal as to where this system is going to work. Yeah, it's interesting. And then I know this is obviously projecting, but would you see it to become similar to d Japan where it's deflationary and, you know, it doesn't matter how low you put the interest rates, there's no inflation? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So, I mean, what I say in the book is that what happened back in the Asian financial crisis was a battle between two forms of capitalism. We, well, let's just call one American capitalism and the other was not what I call North Asian capitalism, that'd be Japan, Korea, and China. And, and the capitalism of Japan is very different. It's much more a communal thing. It's less about profits. It's more about stakeholders and the two fought a battle. Right? Without giving away the book, basically what's happening is the two forms are likely to kind of merge and become more, more similar. And the more similar they become, then that would give you a lower return on capital in the, what we previously called the capitalist system. Uh, the Japanese return on capital has always been fairly low because they run that sort of system. So the conclusion from this is that we're all morphing into much more of a similar system. And that is akin in terms of uh, the developed world to something that was really underway between 1945 and 1978. And that's a very different system. So it's a fascinating subject because... You can just sort of look at Japan and say, is it going to be inflation or deflation? I think it's going to be inflation, personally. Maybe we can talk about that as a separate issue. But more importantly than that, it's that we're all going to become more Japanese because the nature of the corporation, its goals and incentives are going to be more aligned with the goals and incentives that Japanese corporations have always had because they come from a much more communal rather than individualistic society. So you've probably guessed by now we could do another 90 minutes on this. <laughs> Uh, delving into sociology, philosophy, and psychology. But that's the really big interesting story here is, is are we all going to become more Japanese? It's interesting because I guess you can say it's similar to, you know, what we've seen with ESG and, you know, everyone's got that goal to, you know, do everything for the greater good, basically, isn't it? As you said. Yeah. So that's a very good way of putting it. I mean, I, I think if you, if you just sit and think about it for a moment, particularly the younger generation and the things you want to achieve for the planet and society, you might see how the corporation is going to have to change. So it's a really peculiar situation to be in as a citizen, because as a citizen, you might say, this is what I want to change. But as a saver, you might recognize that that would undermine the earnings of the corporations. 
but you have to wear both hats at the same. When you're a saver, you wear both hats at the same time, and uh, it's not always easy because what's good for society may not necessarily be what's good for corporations. The most obvious one being just simply putting up corporation tax. I mean, as a citizen, that's probably a pretty good thing. As a saver, that's probably a pretty bad thing. So you're as you get older and your savings accumulate, you find yourself having to wear two different hats. Yeah, as you said, uh, you, you sort of linked it to 1945, obviously after the war, high inflation was very positive for you know people borrowing. So you sort of see it becoming potentially similar to that. Yeah, that's exactly. And you've got that, you just hit the nail on the head there. It has to be to the benefit of borrowers and not to the benefit of savers. That's the crucial thing here. It's easy to say it's to the benefit of borrowers, but who's it not to the benefit of? And that is absolutely savers. So a very good example in 45. If you, if you were one of those great patriots in, in the United Kingdom who funded the government to defeat fascism, in, just in the next 15 years, you lost about 40% of all your savings because you held government bonds. The price of the government bonds went down. Inflation went up. And if you held them, if you were foolish enough to hold them all the way to 1982, I think it was, you lost about 90% of all your money. So you did the right thing, uh, and there were good reasons to do it. Uh, I mean, people were making much bigger sacrifices in their savings. But there was no doubt, anybody, everybody knew that that's who was going to have to pay for this. And that's where we are today. And it's not just a COVID thing. COVID is just, death to GDP was very, very high. COVID's taken us to a higher level. So uh, most savers these days, and savers tend to be older people, are trying to work out how they can have any hope in, at all of beating this inflation tax. Or if you're young, of course, it's exactly the reverse because inflation will have to include wage inflation. And if you're borrowing for a mortgage and interest rates don't go up. So let's, let's be honest here. This is also a transfer of wealth between generations. Uh, I think uh, many young people think the baby boom generation has had it too good in terms of getting lucky with property prices, etc. Well, what we're talking about here is a mechanism through which some of that wealth has moved back in the other direction. Uh, but ultimately it has to come through wage inflation. If it doesn't come through wage inflation, then your generation isn't going to benefit from that transfer. But that's the plan. It's not, an, it's not a spoken plan. It's not overt, but I think you can see it in almost every government policy out there. And the reason it's not overt is that you mustn't frighten the savers. I mean, the savers mustn't know that you're doing this. So I describe this policy as uh, stealing money from old people slowly. <laughs> if you do it slowly enough, they don't really wake up and work it out. So it's been underway for years. And, uh, and I think it'll accelerate. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, as you said, we're seeing it now with, you know, they're saying run it hot, run it hot. And we're, we're definitely seeing that. Well, running it hot, running it hot should be to the benefit of the younger generation. I mean, you guys yeah. should start to get really chunky pay rises and with a bit of luck, more than inflation. And if you were borrowing money, then the value of your debts will be coming down pretty rapidly relative to the value of your income. So, you, you know, old people like me, you can see why we don't like run it hot, run it hot, but I you know, wouldn't necessarily be against it if you were a student. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let, let's go back to sort of Asia and uh, sort of what's happening there at the moment. So would you say there's quite, there are some in, uh, quite a lot of inflows into Asian economies. Do you see any similarities to what happened in the past or? Yeah, the, the fundamentals are very different. These, these guys back when I wrote this book had very large current account deficits, I mean, huge current account deficits, which were all funded in short-term capital inflows. And that's not where Asia is. So that vulnerability isn't there. The one vulnerability that I do pick up though is, is in China. So going back to that crisis, Southeast Asia fell apart literally in one day on the 2nd of July, 1997. But North Asia didn't. And it, nothing happened in North Asia until October. And we were all sitting there thinking, well, nothing can happen in North Asia. They've got big current account surpluses. Some of the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world, nothing can happen. But then what did happen is capital began to come out and it pushed interest rates higher. This was the crucial thing. And suddenly Taiwan just walked away and let its currency fall. And it was just, it was kind of that moment in the cartoon where the roadrunner goes over the cliff and keeps running and running and then suddenly it looks down and falls down. Now I'm bringing it up because it happened. And this, looked like the, this looked like a fortress. It was a fortress that fell apart. And I'm thinking here of China. Uh, and China is a fortress. It's got a significant current account surplus, about 2.3% of GDP. It's got the biggest foreign exchange reserves in the world. But if a capital exodus begins to push interest rates up, I don't think that the president of China would be that keen for foreigners to have that sort of power. And this is a new power for foreigners in China. They've not really had it before. You, you, can't, you don't have that power until you have a large sum of renminbi that you can liquidate and, and export. So in terms of where we are today in the world, I think you know many things have changed, but I think it, it, it tells me that China is a bit more vulnerable to this than before. And of course, the only way China could uh, have a truly independent, unique uh, 
monetary policy would be to create much more flexibility in its exchange rate. So I think one of the lessons from this book is that a, a move to more flexibility in the Chinese exchange rate could be much quicker, though, much nearer than we think. Yeah, it's really interesting. I guess, you, as you said, the outflow of uh, capital, we're seeing that at the moment with you know investors being worried about what the Chinese government will do to some of these big tech companies. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, that's another lesson from the book. When, when I was in Asia, it was quite clear that the Asians were getting their money out of Asia in 95, 98. <laughs> they saw something that worried them, and the foreigners were pouring money in. And if you're ever in a, in a country when the locals are taking money out and the foreigners are putting it in, nine out of ten times the, the locals are right. The locals can see something. And of course, when it comes to China, locals have been taking money out of China for a very, very long period of time. It is in many cases illegally taken out, but it is taken out. That has been accelerating. And I think we need to ask more clearly, if China is such a great investment proposition, why are so many local Chinese people getting as much money out of the country as they possibly can? And that was a lesson from from this book and from the last crisis. And also, if you're, if you're sitting down looking at emerging markets today, the finger of suspicion points to China. Yeah, and I guess we're seeing that in Australia, UK, properties being bought, you know, businesses being bought, everything like that. Um, are there any opportunities that you're currently watching in Asia? I'm not sure if there's any opportunities that you think may be potentially interesting for foreign investors. Well, so it's, we, we discussed a subject called financial repression, which, which is basically almost inevitable when you've got far too much debt to GDP. With the exception of China, nowhere else in Asia has it. Debt levels, it's, it's probably one of the overhangs from the, the Asian financial crisis that people learned a lesson about having too much debt. And it's certainly if you look at the government sector, it's incredibly low. It's relatively low in the corporate sector and quite low in the household sector. So if you invest in a region where they don't have a lot of uh, debt to GDP, then you don't have to have this financial repression that we mentioned earlier. Mm. So I, I have a fairly upbeat outlook in the longer term for Asia. In the shorter term, interest rates will go up as inflation goes up, and that's never good for financial markets. But uh, if, let's say, you lived in the United Kingdom and you thought financial repression was coming, what's the very first thing you should do? Well, get your money out of the country, actually, is the first thing you should do. But you can only do that if you can find a place where there isn't going to be any financial repression. Uh, and I think it'll be Asia. I also think they'll be hard hit initially with the, the growing Cold War with China. But in the long term, they benefit from that as we have to increasingly source a lot of materials and products from somewhere other than China. And Asia will grab a portion, a portion of that business. So uh, none of that should make you particularly positive in the short run. But in the longer run, I think uh, there's lots of reasons why Asia is going to be one of the better places to have money for the next 10, 15 years. And of course, if you're uh, only 22, you should be thinking 30 years, not just 10, 15 yeah. years. And uh, you've, got, you, you've got the luxury of time. And the luxury of time, I think, is on the side of Asia. Yeah, perfect. And as you said, obviously, with the Cold War, potentially we've seen China, we've seen Vietnam's benefit from that um, we're, since 2018. So there's potential for that as well. So, Russell, uh, as you said, I'm sure we could talk forever about this sort of this stuff, but thank you so much for joining the podcast. Um, on to my final question. Sort of what is one message you'd like people to take away from the book? My lesson from the book is don't... Learn something more than the rational, if you like. You know, I walked into a room that was full of people who, th who thought everything they saw was rational. Everything they saw, I and mean, they, they all had finance degrees. Many of them had MBAs. And on the model that they had gained from that, it, everything looked normal. It looked perfectly normal. What they needed to have was a perspective on credit and money, some of those macro factors. The credit, maybe something more on behavioral finance. There were these other skill sets that were missing. They, I mean, there was, there's some people who made these mistakes that lost 90% of their money were some of the most highly educated people on the planet because they had one schemata, they had one model. And if you find yourself kind of relying on one model, you know, it can work. I mean, this is the problem that sometimes it works for a year or two and you think, I'm a genius, my model is a genius. If you ever seen yourself sitting down with a model that you're convinced is working, I think it's time just to be very cautious and always, always, always try and speak to somebody who disagrees with you. That's the number one thing to do. Because when you get to these dangerous phases, everyone's agreeing, seek out someone with a different opinion and listen. And uh, in our private lives and in our financial lives, listening is probably the most difficult thing of all. So if you can practice a bit more listening and listen to people who disagree with you, I think that's my advice.
Yeah, I definitely agree. Great piece of advice. And I think, yeah, as you said, not uh, people love to talk, but they don't like to listen sometimes, especially if it's what they do, disagree with. So as I said, Russell, thanks again. Uh, if someone wanted to buy the book, where would the best place for that be? Well, of course, we all know the answer to that question, don't we? It's a listed stock in America and starts with an A and ends with an Amazon. So uh, <laughs> it's always the best place, but hopefully a bit more widely available than that. And, uh, and for those of you who want to wait, it's, it's, it should be out in an audio book in a couple of months as well, if you prefer. To consume books that way, that's fine. So it'll come out as an audio book as well. So that's where you can get it. All right, perfect. Thanks again, Russell. Really appreciate okay. it. Okay, cheers.